This is My Geek Profile, a My Geek Culture podcast where we chat to various personalities of the Australian entertainment industry who have entertained us over the years. My name is Matt Fulton, producer, editor and host. I've been part of the media landscape for more than 15 years and I love finding out more about people who have been on television, movies, music, radio, just to see what makes them tick as well as entertain. Johnny Goodman, Mr Sparkle, the Sandman. His signature monotone voice has been etched in our minds, delivering deadpan stories about sharehouse life. But on the other side of his crooked smile, a musician performing high-energy cabaret music. These are different personas of comedian Steve Abbott, who has been making you laugh on stage, screen, TV and radio for around 40 years. Some signature works in his CV are the Castanet Club, Good News Week, ABC's Bird Brain Podcast, In Siberia Tonight, Triple J, and popping up in a few films like 1988's Young Einstein. But there's more than just being the Sandman. So I spoke to Steve to find out more about his career. Steve Abbott, thank you for talking. It's a pleasure. And we haven't even started yet. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. I might change that view as we go on, but at the moment it's a pleasure. Fantastic. Now, your career covers all forms of entertainment, uh, from radio, music, TV, film, writing, and even a podcaster. Now, can you take me back to how you started? I had nothing to do with the entertainment industry. I kind of grew up in a lot of different places, including Broken Hill and Wollongong, but it wasn't until I went to Newcastle and went to university there in, uh, I don't know what year, maybe 76. And I accidentally took drama as a sort of subject and I kind of got hooked very quickly and had um, visions of becoming a, a legitimate actor. And that went away very quickly when I realized that I wasn't very good at legitimate <laughs> acting. And and at the same time, I'd always played guitar and I, I started getting into bands and uh, the two things sort of came together slowly while I was in Newcastle, like the music and the, the comedy came a bit later because I started writing songs, which I thought was serious, but turned out to be, you know, mildly amusing. And that's when I, I started to sort of enjoy talking to audiences. And, and so in Newcastle, pretty much in the seventies is where it all started for me. And, I became a professional actor for a while and, and a musician and f- formed a group called the Castanet Club with a few others, uh, well, very a lot of others. It was a very economically unviable set up, 12 people on the road, and we, we had a nightclub and we, we performed there every Monday night and other nights of the week occasionally. And that took, a, took the entire 80s that went and I was always – developing my character there it was always the same sort of character as the Sandman, but it was, uh, you know, a work in progress du- during this time. I, I didn't know I was going to end up being the Sandman. That probably started when I played a tortoise in a theatre and education show. So I did about 150 shows wearing a fiberglass shell and uh, talking in a monotone voice and not doing very much. And, and I found I was quite funny if I did that. And then I folded that in with these story songs that I was writing and that was the genesis of Sandman, really. And really, though, secretly, I'm impersonating my mother. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I came to realise all this time and then only recently I realised that's exactly what I'm doing. Uh, I I was impersonating my mother, which is, I I mean, I know read what you may into that, but I think that's probably... That that's probably what the Sandman is anyway. Was uh, she aware of that? No, no. When when I told her she had dementia, so uh, oh. it didn't really mean very much to her. I mean, yeah. But so I, look, I suppose I became an all sorts performer. Like I started as an actor, I was a musician, and then I had the opportunity to write plays, and I did a lot of performing, and then not so much stand up. I was always performing in a group, and then the late eighties, I started to get involved in stand-up and still writing plays. And one day uh, I was a friend of Mikey Robbins from Newcastle University and, you know, one day Mikey uh, asked me if I wanted to come. I'd kind of developed this character to a point and we wanted, he said, why don't you try this out on Triple J? And, uh, and I did and called it The Sandman and, and that's when it really hit, you know, it, Triple J just gone national 
there were all these losers like Beck and, and Radiohead and Nirvana that is type of that type of philosophy and the Sandman just was at the right place at the right time really well that's how I uh, became a fan of yours uh, it was through Sandman and on the early stages of Triple J so yep. I'm in that era of your persona of Sandman yep. so I missed yeah. out on the times when you were doing the Castanet Club and you uh, were doing that persona of Johnny Goodman yeah that's right well, Johnny Johnny Goodman was like a placeholder for Sandman very sim- similar sort of self-obsessed, d- downbeat character, uh, kind of loser, mediocre at everything, and as same sort of thing, but not as well realised. But Johnny Goodman was mainly uh, a character in the. Uh, he was called the Master of Sadness in the Castanet Club, and and I started writing songs uh, as Johnny based on growing up in Wollongong, really, a lot of the stories, which ended up becoming the basis of Sandman stories as well. So, I mean, there was a long period of where, you know, I was just working stuff out. And, uh, so the Castanet club was a 12 piece band started in Newcastle, uh, toured all around Australia relentlessly, went to the Edinburgh festival before other acts were going there. There was only, We went in 84 there and there was only one other Australian act on at that point, Mark Little, who was a really amazing comedian. Uh, We won the best of the fringe in 1984, much to our surprise. (laughs) Like we, we were very daggy act. Like we were like the punk version of dag. Yes. And we played everything very fast. Everybody, there was no focus on stage, just 12 people doing their own thing at the same time. And uh, it was uh, it went really well for you know about eight or nine years. We made just made a living out of it, and uh, but it was a real act of the eighties, and uh, you know, and that's when Das started. A few years later, we we just came a little bit before Das. Uh, they they arrived in about eighty six, I think, and that sort of group of people, which a lot of them had come from art school backgrounds and and rock and roll and and. That seemed to be where most of the, the comedians of the 80s came from that we socialised with, uh, sort of an art school background or a, a uni background. Uh, other groups like Funny Stories, I don't know, people, I don't know if you heard of them, Los Trios, Ring Barkas, uh, you know, and this, there was the big gig became the big outlet for a lot of these 80s acts and I wasn't quite ready for uh, <laughs> national television. Johnny hadn't matured enough or wasn't... Uh, Johnny Goodman, that is, wasn't uh, really uh, created enough to be on national television. But the first time I did appear on it, I appeared with Flacco on a Flacco TV special. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we became we became fans of each other in the late eighties. Uh, he really loved this song I used to open with when I did solo stuff called "My Parents Will Be Dead Soon," <laughs> and that uh, th- very much appealed to him. And he asked me to come on his big gig special. And that's kind of where we started our, you know, it kind of clicked with us even then. And But we, that's when we th- first got the th- thought that we should do stuff together. Uh, but Mikey, Mikey, who was in the Castanet Club as well briefly, um, and he was at university a few years behind me, uh, he was pivotal in getting me a job at Triple J when Helen Razor and he were doing the breakfast shift. And then I got... I kind of helped get Livo or Flacco involved as well. So we became a little quartet, uh, um, you know, Mikey and Helen steering the ship and Sandman and Flacco offering their, you know, advice to the unpopular and burnt offerings or whatever uh, Livo was doing. And it was an amazing period of time to go from obscurity to um, national prominence. Wow. <laughs> you know, finger snap was frightening. There was also uh, the movies that you had starred in as well, whether they're large or small roles, such as Young Einstein playing Brian Aspirin, Children of the Revolution starring alongside your yep. old mate as well, and You Can't yep. Stop the Murders, all in the pride of Wollongong, which is one of Sandy's favourite uh, locations too. Now, um, yeah, yeah. how fun were they uh, to film? I know, I know they're all different and diverse in their own ways, but which... Yeah. What do you have treasured well, memories of? I pretty much played the same character in every one. <laughs> so, uh, yet, yet again, I'm very limited, Matthew, as an actor. You know, I've, I played uh, a version of Sandman in Young Einstein. That came first. Um, Yahoo came to the Castanet Club 
and he thought we'd be great as these asylum characters. And uh, um, he was he was an ex Newcastle guy as well. And I don't know. He cast us in a the first version of Einstein, which turned out to be a seven minute uh, a seven minute show reel, which he then took to financiers uh, in. Europe, I think, and that's how he funded his movie. And then he made the real version much later and uh, where we filmed still in Newcastle a bit, but um, mostly in Sydney, I think. So young Einstein, I mean, that was, I have very, very vague memories of it, to be honest. I just know my very first day of shooting on on the main movie was I had to be naked for two days with everybody else in 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 the jockey's change room at Randwick Racecourse shooting the bathroom scene. And everybody was naked, uh, but uh, Yahoo had uh, flesh-coloured underpants on. Ah, oh, so, cheater. <laughs> yeah, so, and, but it was weird because, you know, like two days we were in like tepid, lukewarm bath water with no pants on or, you know, more naked, <laughs> which became a theme in my work later on. Eh? Because you're talking about the nakedness, when you did the Flacco and Sandman Unspectacular yeah, and you, you're on stage – in front of everyone, how did you how did you have the nerve to do that? Like confidence. Uh, well, yeah. Well, one of the secrets, I think, certainly performing a character like Sandman is you've just got to be, you just got to be own it. You just got to be super confident because there's a lot of gall in the Sandman persona, and you've just got to be super confident. That's true. But uh, no, no, I was shit scared as well because uh, I just thought it was a really great idea, you know, and, and I didn't have to sell it very hard to Ted Robinson. He loved the idea of it and that I was accusing Paul of stealing my costume and I was so, <laughs> so angry with him that I just came on stage naked and didn't care about the audience to accuse him of stealing my costume. And I, I think the premise was really good and Paul played it brilliantly and it was a funny idea. But um, I, at that taping in the town hall at Melbourne, I mean, I, I think we were full, so we had about 2,000 people there. And uh, my son was in the audience that night too. And and when I told him I'd be going naked during the show, like he, this is pre-show, he begged me to wear underpants. He was about 11, I guess, something like that. He begged me to just do it, not do it, like wear underpants. And But I went to Ted and said, look, I think I, I'm going to have to change and do it in undies. And he said, nah. And I mean, he was right. And I'm glad I did it. Uh, Plus, I, I shot part of it the night before. There was the bit where I go down out. I don't know if you remember it, but I, you, you walk outside the town hall on um, Exhibition Street, strangely enough, <laughs> down the stairs, and then to the car that was parked out the front. And it was a freezing night, and there were about four hundred people gathered around the car, like out of frame, watching me do that about two or three times oh, as well, no. which was humiliating. But it was still to this very day, not so often now, but still to this very day, you know, a couple of times a year people will ask me about that, you know, or remember it. And it's one of those things that people remember that and the fact that I sounded like Bernie Fraser, the ex-Reserve Bank governor. I mean, they're <laughs> yeah. two things that still people bring up to this very day. How did um, you become part of the Good News Week ensemble? Was it because of Good News Weekend when they were quite filling in for Roy and HG at the time? Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. You know, I was on Triple J at the time and uh, Ted had asked me if I wanted to be on the TV show because uh, Flacco was going on and he thought it'd be great if we were both on and then maybe work out something to do together. And at first I said no because I just thought on radio the Sandman was such a vivid – people had their own impression of what I look like on through the radio and it was very effective and. Uh, it was more what I would call the pure version of Sandman when it was like that, you know, the the sort of existential catcher in the rye kind of character, Caulfield. But, uh, you know, and then he, he kept asking me to go on and, and, it, and in the end I decided to do it. And so it was really Ted Robinson from Good Newsweek, you know, the godfather of comedy in the 90s and 80s. I mean, he, he kind of put the pressure on me to be on and I'm kind of glad I did because – it opened up a new way of performing Sandman as well. So that's how it – yeah, Roy and HG were taking a break or something and 
we came in and then pretty quickly we got sold to Channel 10 or we went to Channel 10. And I don't know, I didn't really detect a lot of change in the show. So uh, The only difference was it went for a little bit longer and it had a commercial break. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But it didn't affect what we did. We always uh, we always taped our stuff like uh, before the game started. So we'd go out in the pre-show record our stuff to camera and then during the run of the show we we developed it which was the biggest fun part was coming up with the gap yes. in the show stuff and um it you know that's uh Livo and i used to really love doing that and you know we'd, we'd spend each week you know wetting our pants with laugh or making each other laugh at least about the ideas we'd come up with from, to try and do as little as possible <laughs> on a you know on a locked off camera shot that and we, they couldn't cut away, so we couldn't stuff up or anything. And uh, but it was re- that was the that was the thing I really and, and it was great being with Mikey and Paul and Julie as well. I used to love the warm ups bef- before the taping was always fun and uh, quite uh, well quite horrendous. I had been to a couple of re- uh, studio recordings of that, and one show where it will be on air for on TV for forty five minutes or so. The whole just one session will be like a two hour long episode, and you think now what jokes are actually going to make it on air? And <laughs> yeah, well, Paul Paul's like a, a genius performer. I mean, of all the people I've been on stage with, and you know, I don't think I think it'd be fair to say when we were in the eighties, we weren't huge fans of each other in in the eighties, but we became really good friends through the Triple J times, and and I really I really loved performing with Paul because. He, he suited me. He often just say, before we walk on, I'll say this, you say that, and then we'll have an argument. But that kind of suited me and my character. And, and he was uh, he was very generous to me. If I was going well, I mean, he would keep me going. And if I, if I kind of stuffed up, like he would absolutely tear me apart, which still kind of worked for my character. So I used to love performing with him. And, you know, I still do on the rare times that I, I – you know, have have an opportunity to go on stage with him. One of your earliest forays into television was writing for, and I, I can't remember because it was only on for a couple of episodes. But were you performing also on the Comedy Sale? Oh yeah, 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 yeah the Comedy Sale. Yeah, well, that was uh, I forget. I don't know what network it was on. Was it Channel Seven? Maybe. Yeah, Channel Seven, and it was a sketch yeah. comedy show based on the workings of a shopping centre. Yeah, yeah. Who who thought that was a good idea in the end? Yeah. But I mean, there was some ama- amazing people on it. I mean, you had uh, uh, Colin Lane and Frank Woodley, the Umbilical Brothers. I think weren't they on that as well? Mikey, myself, uh, Dana Reed, who's now a famous uh, film and TV director, Handmaid's Tale, and all these episodes of that stuff. And uh, so it, Celia Ireland, who was a who's a really established and credentialed actor. So no, I'm probably missing quite a few people there, but it was an amazing group of people on the show. And I think actually that's, I started doing a version of the Sandman again <laughs> on that show. <laughs> where, where I think it was called Mr. Sparkle or something. That rings a bell. Uh, yeah, and I did some story about a budgie flying into a hot cup of tea and his legs withering off or something. And <laughs> I think I might have been a key cutter. And uh, and that's the thing Mikey said – and. And uh, now that oh, yeah, anyway, that's when Mikey said, "Look, you should come and do this on Triple J then, and but you might want to change the name, you know." So I didn't sound as creepy as Mister Sparkle, but it was like the, the Sandman, and I think that name came from we did a Mikey and I and a few other people like Peter Burner and some other people did a failed TV pilot for Channel Seven, and I I was doing that's right. I'd forgotten about this. I was doing bedtime stories for depressed adults and I called myself the Sandman. And I may have even done that budgie story as well, the same budgie story there. And that's that that's where I got the name anyway on that show. If that makes I can't remember the name of the show at all. Oh, oh Saturday Night Live it was called. What a <laughs> creative title that was. Yeah. <laughs> Very yeah. original. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you've yeah. Well, you've written a lot of books as well under your Sandman persona yeah. too, um, and yeah, I, I could go on, but there's so many of them. But uh, um, other yeah. than writing, um, you like I'm going to fast forward to 2009. You also did a podcast called Bird Brain, that was for the yeah, ABC. Right. Now this is yeah. all about uh, you, like your passion, uh, supposed passion for bird watching. Now are you a legit uh, bird aficionado? 
well, legit might be uh, sort of stretching it, but <laughs> I am I am quite passionate about bird watching, and I wasn't. Uh, I mean, I had a mild interest in it, and then I went to the ABC uh, and pitched the idea, and um, they gave me some uh, development money to do it. And, and because I I, was st- I went out with really established bird watchers, bird watching to get as many bird sightings as I could possibly get. And I kind of learned a lot very quickly. And uh, I think it was when I was going through a career crisis as well, because the Sandman thing had just been, you know, kind of fallen away by 2009, whenever that was, yeah, was it 2009? It, Sandman was kind of, you know, his time was over a bit and I was trying to looking for something else to do, creative outlet. And so it was like, um, it was a bit about trying to find something else to do in the entertainment industry. And I managed to pick up um, more than the average person's knowledge of birds in the process very quickly. So it was, uh, it was fun to do. I went bird watching, you know, in Mel, uh, Werribee treatment works in Melbourne uh, with a couple of ornithologists and, and then people who were twitches. So, yeah, I really liked that doing that podcast. It was uh, it was a lot more tightly scripted than most most of the <laughs> stuff I normally do. Well, I love that at the end of uh, most of the episodes, you played a little acoustic jingle of uh, your well known Sandman songs or Johnny Goodman songs, such as uh, yeah, one of my favourites, My Dear Virginia. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I wrote that song probably in nineteen eighty four, probably uh, that one. But uh, uh, yeah. They're all kind of based on all my songs are based on memories of or composite memories of living in Wollongong. Really, and that's where they're. I kind of wrote about forty songs between eighty four and eighty five, and, and then I never wrote another song. Oh. <laughs> I, just, I never. I just cannot write a song to save myself now, and I, I. I didn't sing them for a while because I was such a crap singer, but. Uh, well, and then I realised it didn't matter if I was crap, you know, and, and I just had to be confident. So, well, one of my favourites is "This Is My Surfboard." So that that one, is, oh, yeah. yeah, is one of my favourites. But you do have a big collection. <laughs> that, that's my favourite one. So, oh, okay, yeah, no, it's one of my favourites too. I mean, I like Virginia, but because I've done it so often, it's, I'm a bit numb to it. But uh, but surfboard, I rarely would perform. So, yeah, very rock. Uh, now, in 2005, and I actually attended a recording of this too, you uh, hosted your own talk show on SBS, which was in Siberia Tonight. The one I went to yep. was the one that had John Safran in. That was themed on your heritage, really. Now, how did yep. that show come across? Who approached you for this? Or did you approach that? Uh, it was a woman who was the commissioning editor at uh, at uh, SBS. Her name was Glennis Rowe, and she'd actually – was the producer of the Castanet Club film. And uh, we, we'd become friends. And then she thought that just before that show, I was actually um, commissioned to make a documentary about my mother and I going back to uh, Siberia to look for the place where my grandmother was born. And it turned out we, we, we thought it was going to be a hilarious like Beverly Hillbillies in reverse type of thing, but it turned out we actually, it was quite, you know, confronting because we met relatives who were extremely poor and, you know, and here we were making a kind of frivolous documentary. So, but the thing, that thing rated really like it went well. It was before who do you think you are and all those shows. So it was just predated those and it went really well. And on the back of that, Glenn has said, why don't you do this variety show? host it and the big challenge was that was not being in character and being on tv as myself because i'd virtually spent all, my entire life playing a character when i was performing so it took me a while to get used to that and that two seasons of that and then that led to another sbs show called under the grandstand which was my all-time favorite show it was where i um, it was in the lunch breaks of the 2005 Ashes cricket test in and when it was played in England and so it was so in the 22 minutes at lunch break I did a live to air show from the club rooms of the Eastern Suburbs Cricket Club at Waverley Oval in uh, in uh, Bondi sort of area and uh, it you couldn't rehearse it and it was all live to air and wow. uh, that was really a buzz that show and um, I. 
it's I'd love to do another show like that. I would I actually wouldn't like to do another show like that. It was too stressful. <laughs> but so I'm 65 now and I'm very happy that I don't have the stress of that like being on television daily and and I think to be on television now would be so much more difficult than it was uh you know even in the 2005 type of area you know so but uh, that was my favourite show. I love that show. Yeah, you'll have to be on a reality show now, so you'll, you, I'm sure that you'll be able to fit on Dancing with the Stars or something like that. Yeah, no, no, I, I can only bend twice a day. I've got <laughs> tiny hamstrings, so it's. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I, I, I would, I would be, you know, I wouldn't move much, you know. So it's, uh, so anyway, that was the, yeah. So that's kind of how it came about through knowing somebody really, and then one show I did the documentary went well, and that kind of. And I had a nice relationship with SBS for about three or four years, and it was good. And I worked with my mother, which was bizarre. Yeah, we did a cooking segment, my son's favorite meals, and it was very bizarre. But you know, because my mother couldn't really, she doesn't act at all. So you, you, we had to set up and ask her to come at half an hour later. And the moment she came in the door, we just start filming her, and we'd go for forty minutes to, to get about six minutes. Oh, wow. Because, you know, mum had no idea. She just, she was herself completely and it was hilarious. You know, I thought she was great to work with. So what are your future projects um, that you have lined up, even though like COVID might be affecting any of that? Uh, are you planning to do more stage shows, especially with uh, your partner in crime, uh, Livo or Flacco? Yes. Yeah, we are. We've kind of, we started just before COVID. We, we, we got the band back together and uh, we tried out some stuff in Newcastle, went to the Perth Fringe. Port Ferry Folk Festival and somewhere else I can't think of right now. And we were just starting to get in the groove and COVID hit. And uh, uh, so we, we, we postponed everything. And then uh, we, we did a gig about three weeks ago, a little tryout gig at the 505 at Newtown. And we wanted to put more of ourselves in the show as opposed to and less Flan- Sandman and Flacco. Uh, and it was more of a, a celebration of the guys behind the uh, – the death of our two characters. So, <laughs> uh, and it went, went really well. It was a bit of a rabble, but it, the a potential for a really good fun show. And we both really enjoyed doing that the other day. And we're going to do more. We're going to Bathurst, I think in June we, and we intend to go to Melbourne, you know, just casual. It's like a gentleman's tour, you know, older, the older gents are on tour. We don't want to kill ourselves and, we think we can get you know good solid small audiences at most places, but apart from that, I, I pretty much have a little production company now with another a f- old friend from the Castanet Club, who Warren Coleman, who uh, co-wrote the Happy Feet One and Happy Feet Two movies, and and together we we sort of uh, write for television and we pr- try and get our own movies up, and uh, which is not easy these days, certainly for guys. Uh, our age, but so we have a little production company called Bongo Island. Oh, cool. And uh, we, that's, that's how I kind of make a living mostly these days, if you can call it that, that a job seeker and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and Livo and I are going back out on the road. Like I said, we'll start again in June. So we're going to somewhere in Bathurst in June. Would you consider at least releasing the Sandman books, but, Redoing them, um, what do you call audio book? So even though even though they're well, a radio serial, but would you re-record them for today? Uh, well, I, I did do a lot of audio books back in the day of all this stuff. Um, I, well, look, if there was an if there was somebody wanted to do it, I mean, I would happily do it. Yeah. Well, we, we, Livo and I started to do. We started just uh, improvising and made of ours as cameraman, and we started going to his place and in this kind of dark room and it's like we were disembodied heads floating around, but we started improvising stuff and that was good fun. And we, we put a few out, but you know, we're very lazy. We're (laughs) kind of lazy too. I understand. We're both exactly the same age, you know, and we, we, we're, it takes a lot to motivate us to go and, and, uh, you know, go out and do stuff. So, yeah, you know, like we're two grumpy old men when we go around on a tour together <laughs> and we complain about everything and we don't want to do it, but yet we still keep doing it. So we're kind of backing into the spotlight all the time, you know. Anyway, these are good ideas and 
And I honestly, I did nothing today. I got up here and I collected firewood and got some kindling and made a casserole. So that was my day down here. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Abbott, thank you for talking. Matthew, thank you very much for having me. Check out the Sandman and Flacco Facebook page for future tour dates. Thanks for listening to My Geek Profile podcast for mygeekculture.com.au. This podcast is produced by Matt Fulton Productions, mattfulton.com.au.